Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I received an email not long ago from a gentleman I've uh, responded to before, and he had a a long email with some various questions and comments. I want to jump into some of these questions and get to publicly because I think they're very good ones that would apply to a lot of people. He speaks about his church leaders who's been involved at a church, and he says they when they want to talk to me about my, my theology, they find troublesome, but never want to talk about my past or if I'm currently struggling with anything. That is, there it seems to be these people are more interested in talking about his theology than his past. But he says, quote, I've been wrong about many things, so I wouldn't be surprised if I still get some things wrong. The lead pastor has a bachelor's degree from Oral Roberts, and most others haven't gone to school or training for Bible, theology, etc. Also, they don't usually recommend sources except Timothy Keller, who's fine, I guess, and the Bible. It's hard to just take them at their word that my theology isn't Christian or very Christian at times, end quote so far. So what he's saying is they don't think his theology is very Christian, but they don't really... They care about it. They're more condemning it versus giving other sources besides Timothy Keller. And Timothy Keller, Keller is a smart guy. Pastor's written a couple books, and I like his stuff. I guess he's not a scholar per se, but he's he's a smart dude, and I think writes some writes some good books. I'll continue. Quote: I definitely want it to be. And he means having Christian theology, right? I want it to be, and I have read your books, and I've read I have been reading Hurtado, Walton, Wright, Keener, and Goodacre. Most of the leaders haven't heard any of these scholars, including you. <laughs> let, me, let me pause there real quickly to say, yeah, I don't doubt they haven't heard of me, because <laughs> that's very kind of you, but I'm not at all the level of a Hurtado and Walton and Wright or Keener or Goodacre, so they're, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a nobody. Those people are a somebody, so that's that's sweet, but they, uh, they, they're not going to hear of me. I'm, I'm not at their level. Anyway, he goes on, the few who do recognize a couple of names are concerned that I'm reading from liberal thinkers that may eventually pull me away from biblical Christianity. I don't know who is liberal and who is not, but I believe you recommended these writers so I feel they're safe. I do believe the church leaders care about me and they desire for me to have good sound theology. And by all means, I could be misunderstanding what I read and I may need to correct or nuance my theology differently. But I share all this because in the end, I trust you and respect your opinion. And he says, I have many questions, and here are a couple of them. Let me end quote there and say thank you so very much. I, I very much humbly appreciate your trust and respect. And I also uh, respect and appreciate their desire to help you in proper theology. I do. Uh, and I do. One of the things I don't do much, I'm torn. I don't label people that much. I don't do the whole conservative, liberal, blah, blah much. I don't because... Because, of course, what is, right? It typically writes people off immediately. It's an ad hominem argument. If one scholar is liberal, then I never have to read her or him. And that that's silly. I mean, that that's silly because, especially in our American culture these days, people are so quick to label people and just write them off instantly. That's very troublesome. Simultaneously, some categories are quite helpful. They say a lot. For example, if I say, I'm a Calvinist or I'm Reformed or... It doesn't say everything about me, but it says something versus saying I'm a Wesleyan, I'm Arminian, I'm a whatever. So I'm not fully against using labels at all times, but I'm typically against them. And I typically encourage people to read whomever they want. So when I recommend people like Larry Hurtado or John Walton or N.T. Wright or Craig Keener or Mark Goodacre and on and on and on they go, it's because I think their arguments are very compelling. It is not because they fit into a predetermined mold of labels, like they are conservative, they are liberal, they are whatever. They're the safe ones. I don't think everybody who writes is safe. They either make good arguments or they don't. They either produce evidence or they don't. Who, who cares what label they have? 
So when I recommend people lie, I typically don't recommend people based on their allegiances or my labels for them. And other people are not the same way as I am. They, <laughs> it's easier and maybe they're quicker to say, oh, I wouldn't read them because they're liberal. But that's up to you. You can decide whether you listen to such people or whether you claim... I mean, that's just up to you. You get to decide whether or not you want to look at the world that way. I don't. So I appreciate their desire to help good theology. I don't appreciate their desire to label the theology. I don't appreciate the desire to label the theology like, quote, liberal thinkers. What I would be much more concerned about is whether or not the person is having a good, uh, good evidence-based historically and social and literary context-based argument and conclusion more than whether or not they're quote-unquote liberal or conservative. So anyway, that's what I do. So you can do what you want and how, whether you find them reliable, there you go. Well, on to the questions. Your first question is, is it wrong to say Jesus hasn't always existed? You say, I believe the word is God and he became flesh and that was Jesus, the God-man. For me, the word always existed, but Jesus did not. End quote. To that, I would say yes and no. I would say yes and no. It is true, it's accurate in Christian orthodoxy to say that Jesus has not always existed because Jesus is the name we have given to the member of the Godhead who assumed flesh. So God the Son, who existed eternally, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, God the Son didn't have the name Yeshua or Jesus. That name was given to the incarnated Son of God, the incarnated, the, that is incarnate, the one in flesh. So the word is God, or just as, as John says in his prologue, he didn't, be, he didn't become flesh necessarily in that sense. He took on flesh, um, and that is Jesus, the God-man. That's exactly right. So the Word has always existed, but the Word did not exist with flesh until the Incarnation. And when the Word took on flesh, or assumed flesh as well, and this, this human nature of soul and body joined together, then that, that person of the Trinity received a name. And that name, of course, was Jesus. So that's, that's the distinction we have to always nuance that carefully. When someone says, if they hear, oh, Jesus didn't already exist, oh, you're, that's unorthodox. Well, let's explain that first. Jesus, as the God-man, did not always exist. The Word did. That's also why it's wrong to say God became flesh. That's very, very common. God didn't become flesh. God's Son became to call him flesh. God the Word to call him flesh. Not God as in the Trinity did not. And God the Father did not take on flesh. God the Son did. Your second thing you say is this, I've heard messages about God not being able to look at sin or have someone with sin in his presence. I don't know if that is true, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on the subject. I'm not sure if all of scenes in Job between Satan and God in his throne room actually happened, but if they did, how can he handle Satan in his throne room unless Satan hadn't sinned and was not a bad guy at this point? If he was a sinner at that point, then surely if he could allow Satan in his presence and he could handle looking upon sin... I believe God hates sin, but if he couldn't look at Jesus when sin is put on him, then how is he ever able to look upon us before we are saved? End quote. These are good questions. Let me say a few things about that. Typically, people go to Hebrews chapter, not Hebrews, sorry, Habakkuk 1. Habakkuk 1 is the chapter in the verses of verse 13. People, most people go to, to talk about God not being able to, quote, look upon sin. In Habakkuk, particularly in Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk is just really worked up that evil people are doing evil things. And he's basically talking to God saying, what are you waiting on? Why is it you tolerate evil things and when, you, when we all know you don't do that? We all know you don't like that. And it really says in Hebrews 1, Habakkuk 1.13 that your eyes, you, your eyes, uh, that... How do I say this? Your eyes are pure. Your eyes are pure. And so sometimes that's translated as your eyes are too pure to behold evil and you cannot look on wrongdoing or you cannot see it. Well, that is what literally what it says. I think the NET does a great job translating, a little interpretation, but translating exactly what the point is. The NET translates it this way. You are too just to tolerate evil. 
you are unable to condone wrongdoing. So why do you put up with such treacherous people? Why do you say nothing when the wicked devour those more righteous than they are? So if you read this to mean God the Father or Son or Spirit cannot literally look at evil itself, I don't find that compelling at all. One is because I don't think that's what the, the best way to interpret this verse. Two, I don't think that evil is a thing that God looks at or cannot look at. I think evil is not a thing. It can be talked about as if it's a thing, but I don't think evil actually is a thing. Thirdly, God the Father, Son, and the Spirit do not see things. God the Father, and the Spirit particularly, before Jesus became Jesus, could not see anything. He doesn't have eyeballs to see in that sense. God is aware of things. He has knowledge of things. He's not literally see something. So I do not read Habakkuk 1.13 as a literal description as if God the Father is wandering around blindfolded to sin because he just can't see it. He just can't see it. Or if sin comes in his presence, he just goes blind all of a sudden. I mean, that just it just seems crazy to me. But I know this is preached about a lot, and I've heard it from sermons. I've heard people, I think well-intentioned, say this kind of stuff, but I think it's nonsense. When, they, when Habakkuk, in my interpretation, and this isn't idiosyncratic, this is a standard interpretation, but whatever. Uh, when Habakkuk speaks about this, he's saying, we know, God, that you're good and you don't like this. It's like when the psalmist cry out, oh God, when are you going to wake up? How long are you going to let the evil prosper over me? We all know that you're a righteous, good God. What's wrong with you? How can you allow this to happen? So they're mad at him. I mean, that's they were mad back then. They're mad now. I mean, I would be mad when bad people do junk to me. It makes me mad too. I'm like, how can you let this happen? I, that's the only point. It's not that. The point is, how can you tolerate it? How can you let it happen? Not not, wait a second, they're sinning and you can't see sin. I mean, that, that just mean, frankly, sounds pretty silly. Your second point when it comes to Job and Satan, that's a very good point because in the book of Job, Ha Satan is actually not his name. It literally means the accusing one. Satan is not a name. When it has the article as it does, Ha Satan, it's a title. So the name, Hasatan takes on the name Satan a lot, lot, lot longer after the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, he doesn't have a name. He's not an individual character. So in Job, it's the accusing one. It's like his job description. It's like saying the plumber came up, the cable guy walked up, or whatever it is. So here's the accusing one. He acts like a prosecuting attorney. In Job and other parts of the Old Testament, the accusing one is not evil. He's not corrupt. He is a being that God has created who has a job function, and his job function is the accusing one. His job is to help point out when someone's done wrong or and or they have a false faith. So the origin of Job, that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. So he comes and does his job. So God is not in the presence of evil when Job speaks. Well, that's all I have for that as far as the two questions. And I hate, you say later on the email that you hate feeling being treated as naive or stupid. And you want to be a faithful Christian. And I'm with you, brother. I hate feeling like I'm naive or stupid. Uh, and I, nothing you've said to me sounds to me like you're naive and stupid. I, really, quite frankly, nothing. So keep it up, brother. And if people look down on you and condemn you, that's their deal. Try to process those feelings and forgive them. But all at the same time, just keep on going. Be encouraged. Keep doing research. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the King or at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass. There are tons of ways reached out. I hope you will. Send me your questions, send me your comments. If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.